Okay, so today we are going to talk about measures of relative standing as well as box plots. Um, box plots are something that you've been doing for a while, um, also called box and whisker plots. Um, so we have some new things to discuss, some review things to discuss. So one of the new things we're going to be talking about are z-scores. And z-scores are something that we will use throughout this course. It's not just here in this section and then we never see it again. Um, z-scores will be important um, for a while. So um, a z-score by definition is the number of standard deviations that a given value x is above or below the mean. Um, we round all z-scores to two decimal places always. So, you know, mean, median, standard deviation, um, those we talked about rounding to one place past whatever the original data is. On z-scores, we always round to two decimal places. Um, they are expressed as numbers with no units of measurement. So when you check the answers, you know, for section 3.1 and 3.2, most of the answers had a label, you know. Um, the mean is, you know, 72.5 inches. Um, Z-scores do not have a unit of measurement on them. Um, significant or, as we've Discuss that also is the same as saying unusual values or outliers. Those would be values that have a z-score that's either less than negative 2 or above positive 2. Um, the reason for that is because, remember, a z-score represents standard deviations above or below the mean. So if the z-score is below negative 2, that means it's more than two standard deviations below the mean. If it's above positive 2, that means it's more than two standard deviations above the mean. So the requirement hasn't changed from what we did with the range rule of thumb. It's just that the format we write it in is different. So um, the reason we have negatives here is because the negatives represent the values that are below the mean, whereas the positives represent the values above, above the mean. So this little graphic was in the book, um, and I think that illustrates um, really well exactly what's happening with the z-score. So if your z-score is zero, um, then that means that it is the mean. The mean has a z-score of zero. So values that are not significant or not unusual are those in this range between negative 2 and 2. If you get 2 and above, that's significantly high negative 2 and below is significantly low. This is your formula for finding a z-score. You just take the data value that you're given, which is x, subtract the sample mean, x-bar, and then divide by the sample standard deviation. So here we have an example to illustrate z-scores. So over the past 30 years, heights of basketball players at Xavier University have a mean of 74.5 inches and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. The latest recruit has a height of 79.0 inches. Find the z-score for the height of the recruit. So that's what we want to do first. So we're going to be using this little formula guy right over here. So we take our given value, which is our x, so in this case that's 79, so 79 minus x bar, which is the sample mean, which they gave to us, so we don't have to calculate that, 74.5, and then we're dividing by the standard deviation, which they told us is 2.5. So there will be some cases where you have to figure out the mean and standard deviation first. In this case, they gave them to us. Um, so that gives us 4.5 on the top, and then we're dividing by 2.5. So we can do that in our calculator. It um, gives us 1.8. 
which is fine to leave it like that because we round um, z scores to two decimal places. So if you want to put the zero on the end, you can. Um, the book, I think, always does. Um, if it's a zero, I don't care if you just leave it 1.8. Um, you just have to make sure that if there are more than two decimal places that you don't carry those. So our z score would be 1.80. So then it asks, is the height of 79 inches significantly low or high among players over the last 30 years? Explain. So this is a positive number, which means we'd be looking at significantly high rather than significantly low. And in order to be significantly high, the z-score has to be 2 or above. So since this is not, we would say no. So we would say no. Its z-score is not greater than or equal to 2 or less than or equal to negative 2. So that means that it's not significant. Another thing that is in this section is dealing with percentiles. So um, a percentile is a measure of location. And we denote them using P in a subscript. So we would say P1, P2, P99. And you know what a percentile is because you use them all the time with grades and with um, anything that's standardized, but what it does is it divides a set of data, excuse me, into 100 groups with about 1% of the values in each group. So P1 represents being the lowest 1% of the data. P2 is the lowest 2% of the data. Um, P99, the... Um, 99% of the data, which means there's only 1% above. So we can use this two different ways, and we'll do an example of both here in a moment. Um, but if you are asked to find the percentile of a given value x, then this is what you're going to do. Um, you're going to have to have the data in order, because otherwise it's rather difficult to find the number of values that are less than that number. Um, but that's what you have to do. So you take the data, you list it in order, and you count how many values are less than the given value that you have. You put that in your numerator. The denominator is the total number of values that there are in all. And then you multiply that by 100, which is turning it into a percent. Now, sometimes it'll give you, it'll say, find the value that represents, you know, P30. Um, so if you need to find the value and you're given the percentile, this I just um, did a cut and paste from the book because I didn't think I could explain this um, any better than this flow chart does. So it starts the same way as what we do when we're going the other way. We need to sort the data lowest to highest. Um, then you need to use this formula, L equals K over 100 times N. So um, n is the number of values that you have, k is the percentile that you want to find. So if you're wanting to find the 33rd percentile, you would take 33 over 100, or of course you can use the decimal, 0.33, times how many total values you have. So the reason I use this instead of just writing it out is because of the break here. Because sometimes what you get when you do this step is a whole number, and sometimes it's not, and then you have to do two different things. So if it's a whole number, then what you do is you go down um, whatever your L is, let's say it's, you know, um, 10. So then you go in your list of data, and you find the value that would be halfway between the 10th value and the 11th value. Um, so meaning you basically have to find the mean of the 10th and 11th. So if L is 70, you would find the mean of the 70th and the 71st data value. Um, if it's not a whole number, then you round it up to the next larger number, 
and then take that value from the list. Um, now, this says rounding up. You round up no matter what. So even if it were only, you know, 15.2, you would still round it up to 16. So you round up no matter what. So finding a value given the percentile is when we use this chart right here. When we have um, the value and we want to know the percentile, that's when we use just this little formula here. So along with percentiles come quartiles. Quartiles are just a specific type of percentile, um, but quartiles themselves are also measures of location, but instead of denoting them with a P, we denote them Q, 1, 2, and 3. It divides a set of data into four groups with 25% of the values in each group. So again, quartiles are just a specific type of percentile. So Q1 is really the same as P25. Q2 is really the same as P50, and Q3 is the same as P75. So those are all the same thing. IQR is something that we'll be needing to find outliers or significant values, so you need to know how to find the IQR. You simply take the third quartile and subtract the first quartile. Okay. So next is the five number summary, which the five number summary are the values that we use in a box plot. Um, so you should know how to make a box and whisker plot. I will review it for you. Um, but the five values that are in a five number summary are the minimum, the first quartile, the second quartile, which Q2 is the same as the median. So those are one and the same thing, then the third quartile, and then the maximum. So when it asks you to find the five number summary, these are the five numbers that you're going to list. Um, don't worry, I had promised that once we got that, um, past the um, sections where we were learning about mean and standard deviation, um, that you would then be able to use your calculator. So when you're making a box plot or finding a five number summary, we will do that on our calculator. You don't have to do that by hand. And I'll show you how to do that. Hopefully my um, on-screen calculator works today. So a box plot or a box and whisker um, diagram is a graph of a data set that has a line extending from the minimum to the maximum and then on that line, you draw a box um, from the first quartile to the third quartile with a dividing line at the median. So box plots look something like this. Now the location, you know, of the different little notches is going to change. Um, but this is going to be your min, this is going to be your first quartile, the first part of the box, the median is the middle line in the box, the last line of the box is your third quartile, and then the very top um, is the max. So we call it a box and whisker because you've got a box and then these lines extending from it are what we call the whiskers. So. The reason we like box plots um, is really there's two main reasons. Um, one is because it's very easy to identify those quarters. So you can look at a box plot and instantly say half of the values are below this number. A quarter of the values are above this number. Um, so it it gives us just a very quick reference. The other reason is because it's easy to identify skewness um, because a distribution is definitely skewed. And in previous sections, we talked about, you know, looking at the histogram to see if it's skewed left or skewed right. Um, but it's skewed in general if it's not symmetric. So if you've got one whisker, 
that's way longer than the other, then you definitely have skewed um, data. All right, so this is what I was talking about earlier when we wrote down the IQR formula. Um, we can find significant values using our five number summary um, in addition to, so now we've learned three different ways to find outliers or to find um, significant values. Um, we've learned how to do it with the range rule of thumb. Then earlier in this same lesson, we learned how to do that using z-scores. Now we're going to use the five number summary. So the first thing you do is you take one and a half times whatever your IQR is. So 1.5 essentially times Q3 minus Q1. And so that's what we start with, whatever that number gives us. Um, then what we do is we take that number and we subtract it from Q1. And um, that gives us significantly low values. Or um, we take that number and we add it to Q3. And that would give us the significantly high values. So we're going to say significantly low in formula form. The boundary is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, values that are significantly high, we do Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So those give us our boundaries. Okay, now we're going to do an example of the percentiles, box plots, and um, this new way to find outliers. So first one asks us to find the percentile for a reaction time of 2.6. So this is a case where we are given the actual value, not given the percentile. We want to find the percentile. So again, when we go back to our little formulas here, we're given the x, so we're using this formula right here. So we need to find the number of values that are less than x, divide by the total number of values, and then turn it into a percent by multiplying by 100. Now, first thing we have to do is we have to list the data in order. This data is not in order, and that's always our first step for finding percentiles or values of a percentile. So my lowest number there, I believe, is 2. Then I've got two 2.4s here, I think. Yep, those are the next. 2.4, 2.4, then I've got a 2.5, do I have any more? Nope. And I've got a 2.6, I've got two 2.7s, then two 2.8s, Point nine, a three point two, and a three point five. Okay, so now my data is in order, so I need to count the number of values that are less than two point six. So in this case, we have the two point zero, two two point fours, and a two point five. So in this case, there are four values that are less than two point six. The total number of values, it told us in the problem, but we could also count them. There are 12, so 4 out of 12, and then we're going to convert that to a percent, which you guys all know how to look at a decimal and convert it to a percent, but technically what we're doing there is multiplying by 100. So 4 out of 12 is one third, so we should know that's 0.3 repeating. Um, and so that gives us... 33.3 repeating, which means that the percentile would be P33, or you could write it out as 33rd percentile. So either of these answers is acceptable. And I forgot to change this. Um, this 
I, when I went through and edited this, I found a mistake and then forgot to actually correct it. Um, so let's go ahead and correct this. We're going to find the 70th percentile, so P70, um, not the 30th, because that one's not very helpful. So finding the 70th percentile value is the second thing that we talked about. So we've already sorted the data. So now we need to use this formula. So whatever our K is, we divide that by 100 and multiply that by the number of values. So in this case, excuse me, um, we're using L equals K over 100 times N. So K is 70 um, because it's P70. So we take 70%, which is 0 0.7, 70 over 100. And we multiply that by the total number of data values, which in this case is 12. And so here we get 8.4. Okay, so go back to my chart. Is L a whole number? Well, 8.4 is not a whole number, so we would say no. Um, so we change L by rounding it up to the next larger whole number. So the next larger whole number rounds to 9. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to find the ninth value in our list from lowest to highest. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that means that the value that is in the 70th percentile is 2.8. Now again, keep in mind, this one, it didn't come out as a whole number. Let's say that it did come out as a whole number. Let's say that it was just eight. If it were a yes, we would then take the eighth and the ninth values and find their mean. So. Um, in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the 8 and the ninth values are the same. Let's say that it came out to be exactly 9. Well, in that case, the ninth value is 2.8 and the next value is 2.9. So our percentile answer would be 2.85. Um, so again, if it comes out to a whole number, you have to take that one and the next one and find their mean. Okay. Now we're going to find the five number summary and I promised you that you could use your calculator for this so if you don't already have your calculator out please get it out. I'm going to pull mine up. Okay, got my calculator. Hopefully it continues to work the whole time. So first thing we have to do is we have to enter our data in one of our lists. So go to stat edit. Remember that if you've already got stuff in there you'll need to clear it out but we can list our original data. Um, so you can just go down um, the values that I typed, so 2.4 was the first, and just go ahead and enter everything that was in there. Um, you, of course, always want to double check your data um, to make sure that you didn't miss anything or that you didn't have a typo. Um, you can tell right now this says L113. That means it's waiting for me to enter the 13th value. So I've definitely entered 12 things. I just want to scroll through them to make sure I didn't accidentally, you know, enter a 24 instead of a 2.4 or something like that. Okay, so it looks like I've got them all correct. So if I want to find my five number summary, I go to stat and I go to calculate menu. So we scroll right. In this menu, it's choice one. This stands for one variable statistics. So choose choice one. Then you have to name which list your data is in. So mine is in L1, so we're good. The next part you can leave blank, we don't need that. Just scroll down to calculate and press enter. And notice that it gives you a whole bunch of information. So unless I ask you to do it by hand, which again, 
On this quiz, I will ask you to find the mean and standard deviation at least once by hand. But if it doesn't ask you to show your work, then you are welcome to just get it from the calculator. So here it shows you x bar, that's our mean. Then look, even if you are doing the work by hand, this makes it easy to check your work for one of the formulas because it gives you the sum of all x and the sum of all x squared. So that makes that easier. Here's the sample standard deviation. Here's the estimate of the population standard deviation. N is the number of values, and then what comes after that, and you have to scroll down to see them all, are your five number summaries. So it's the last five things in the one variable statistics. So you can see we've got min of two, first quartile 2.45, median 2.7, third quartile 2.85, and max value of 3.5. We will generally round these one decimal place past, um, just like we do for mean, median, um, and so on. So we'll go ahead and find the five number summary. So the min is 2. The first quartile was 2.45. I usually write MED instead of Q2, but make sure you know that those are the same thing. So median and second quartile is 2.7. Then the third quartile was 2.85. And the max was 3.5. So from that, we make a box plot. The thing that people always forget on a box plot is to do the scale underneath. You need the scale underneath and you need labels. So in this case, because our min is two and our max is three and a half, we wanna start a little bit below two and we wanna end a little bit above 3.5. So again, your scale might not be exactly the same as someone else's, um, but those are the general rules that we want to make sure that we start and end a little above and below what we need. So let's say that this is 2. If I go up to 4, that's definitely going to be above 3.5. So if we make this 2, then let's say, I'm trying to space things nicely, then we could make this three, and this four, and so then I would just go in and I put in my halfway marks, so those are going to be my point fives, then below that, point one, point two, point three, point four, point six, point seven, point eight, point nine, 1.2.3.4. These are actually spaced really nicely. I'm kind of proud of myself. And so now we have values um, that start above or start below what we need and go above what we need. Once you've got your scale, then you're going to actually plot your values above it. So um, minimum is exactly two. So I'll put that here. Then our quartile 1 is 2.45. So here's 2.5, here's 2.4. So it's like halfway between. Anytime something isn't on an exact tick, it needs to be labeled. So I don't have to label the 2 because it's on an exact tick mark of my scale. This one needs labeled because it's not. The median is 2.7. So 2.5, 2.7. Sometimes they'll ask you to label all of them. So if it does, obviously you need to. Um, but if it doesn't say, um, then I only need you to label the ones that aren't exact. So this one isn't exact either, 2.85 there. And then finally the max is exact. It's 3.5 exactly. So here's my box. Here are my whiskers, and so there is my box plot. 
All right, last thing is to find the upper and lower limit for outliers using the IQR. So first thing we need to find is the IQR itself. So that's the third quartile, which is 2.85, minus the first quartile, which is 2.45. So the IQR, IQR, by the way, stands for interquartile range. So it's the range of just the box part instead of the entire set of data. So 0.4 is my interquartile range. So that means if I'm trying to find my lower and upper limits, my significantly low limit is going to be, and we wrote it out here, Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. So Q1 is 2.45 minus 1.5 times our IQR, which is 0.4. So then we work that out on our calculator. We get 1.85. For significantly high, we take Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, so 2.85 plus 1.5 times 0.4. And that gives us 3.45. So lower limit for outliers is 1.85, meaning anything there and below is an outlier. Upper limit is 3.45, so anything there or above is an outlier. Our minimum is 2, so we don't have any significantly low values. Our max is 3.5, so we do have significantly high values. Um, 3.5 is the only one. 3.2 is not above the threshold. So using our limits here, we would say that 3.5 is an outlier because it is above the upper limit. All right, that should wrap up section 3.3.